uh, Raleigh Mayor's Committee a meeting. I want to uh, call our February meeting uh, to order. First, let's do some introductions. I'm Ricky Scott, Chair of the Mayor's Committee. Karen Benton, Treasurer. Bob Evans, member. Ginger Rush. Good afternoon. This is Philip Woodward. I am the vice chair and public information chair. And I will be taking the minutes because our secretary, Laurie Millett, is not available today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm Robert Parrish, uh, Chair for Housing Subcommittee. Alice Kelly. Alice Kelly. Donnie Biss, uh, transportation. Beep, beep. <laughs> Anyone, any others? Uh, Sean uh, Abrams is here from the city of Raleigh. And Shannon Garner here for John Samuel as a representative. Okay. Lawrence Carter, y'all probably Lawrence heard Carter. me. <laughs> <laughs> there is a really bad echo. Yep, there are echoes uh, by some. Um, uh, do we have any guests? <laughs> I'm Bill Schwartz with Nelson Nygaard. And good afternoon. I'm Crystal Odom with Campo, Capital Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. I'm David Walker. I'm also with the City of Raleigh uh, Transit Division. Okay, well, thank you all for, for uh, coming to our meeting today. Uh, first of all, before we uh, proceed, uh, as you all have, uh, you all received the notice of the passing of uh, one of our council uh, members who is, who is an active member in the community, Mr. Ron, uh, Ronnie Marshall. So let's have a brief moment of silence and remembrance of him and all of his uh, advocacy efforts in our community. Okay. Okay. Uh, before we proceed, there's just a one minor uh, business item that I wanted to take care of. All of you know of the recent passage uh, uh, by our city council that gives us five thousand dollars a year for scholarships, and we've been thinking about how to allocate this money, and what. I'm recommending is that we give three uh, scholarships for undergraduate students moving forward, one scholarship for $1,000 for a graduate applicant, and in cases where there may not be an un a graduate student, we would award four potential awards to undergraduate students and a $1,000 to the um, Camp Friendly for children with uh, disabilities who participate in our city's recreation program each year. I so move. Do we have a second? I'll second Lawrence Carter. All right, do we have any uh, discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. Yes. Thank you all very much for your support uh, for this uh, great effort by our city in support of scholarships, uh, expanding scholarship opportunities for our people. This well, is today, Paul Woodward here. Who made the motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that was uh, Robert Parrish. 
Philip, don't you know my voice by now? <laughs> Robert Parrish and then Lauren <laughs> Carter seconded. Thank you. Thank you. Whenever yeah. you make Whenever a motion, motion, it's very helpful very if you announce your name. Thank you. Point taken well, Philip Woodward. <laughs> okay. As we move As forward, we since we have presented it today, I had sent out a request that all uh, subcommittee chairs present a written report uh, to the secretary. And so we are hoping that uh, all have done that. So what we're going to do, our first presenter today, uh, Mr. Abrams had requested that uh, Nelson uh, Nygaard Associates present and I'm going to turn it over to him to uh, move forward with the uh, particulars of the presentation regarding this CAMPO report. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, this is Bob Evans. I was yes. hoping that we could have everybody go and mute their systems unless they're talking yes. because of the echo we're receiving. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank that. Thank you, sir. So will everybody award, uh, mute themselves as we move forward here? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Sean Abrams here from the city of Raleigh. Um, as already stated by Dr. Scott, uh, we have uh, Bill Swartz here from Nelson Nygaard. Also, we have Crystal Odom from uh, Campo. And um, right now, uh, we're working on a mobility management uh, study. And uh, Bill is here today to kind of present that study. Uh, to you guys, just to kind of give you guys an idea of what mobility management is um, and maybe take some questions from you. Um, just want to reiterate that um, right now they're in the very early stages. So he's just going to be presenting, giving you an idea of what mobility management is and maybe take some questions if uh, you have some. So with that, I'll just let go ahead, Bill, go ahead and uh, get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm hoping that those of you who can see can see that there's a slide up, a title slide um, for the mobility management implementation study. Um, is there anybody on the call that needs uh, me to describe what the uh, anything that is on the slides? This is Robert Parrish. It's always a good idea to um, give audio description uh, to slides with our group because there are visually impaired people within it. Great, okay, thank you. Um, and so uh, this is just the title slide of a, a, a presentation uh, on the mobility management implementation study. And um, this study uh, is, a, is an outgrowth of the coordinated public transit human services transportation plan for the Wake County and Raleigh urbanized area that um, some of you may have been involved in that project came, uh, was completed. The study plan was developed in 2018 and has been um, amended slightly, but that project, that plan essentially really focused on the need for more rural transportation, um, <clears throat> helping people navigate the services that are available and recommended the establishment of a mobility coordination committee. Um, which uh, has you may have also heard from, but the, that is essentially the regional providers and others that are working to implement the recommendations of the plan. That committee um, identified the need to get some help on implementing the mobility management strategy for the region. So um, um, I'm sharing a, a, a table and graphic right now that shows uh, uh, mobility management, the words mobility management in the center and. Uh, a series of um, sort of uh, circles that point to the middle that represent the different organizations that would participate in a mobility management program. That includes government organizations, um, agencies helping different uh, groups of people who need assistance, veterans, uh, transportation providers, um, uh, health and human service agencies, and so forth. And th this is really about making connections among all the different organizations to help assist people. So the, the mobility management connects people with disabilities, seniors, 
or older adults, low-income individuals and others with accessible, reliable transportation options. Um, and when it's effective, it requires the coordination among all of these partners I mentioned um, to link uh, the available services to the people that need them. And there's also an effort to try and make sure that the where the gaps exist, which tends to be the places where there's either limited or no service, or uh, people aren't eligible for the services that uh, are available, uh, trying to fill those gaps and identify ways to address any sort of barriers to access of those services. So the goal really for a mobility manager or mobility management program is to work with all the different partners and create kind of a, a centralized or one-stop shop where people can find transportation services that meet their needs. <clears throat> um, um, mobility managers, their role um, is to understand what the needs are, to advocate on behalf of the people who uh, need transportation services, to bring people together, um, uh, help to facilitate a process of, of, uh, of uh, you know, advancing programs over time, to come up with uh, new strategies for meeting transportation needs, if of developing a program to, to launch it and, and keep it going over time. Um, uh, ultimately, the people that benefit from um, a mobility management program and are participating in that collaboration, obviously on the customer side, I mentioned um, the different people that really benefit from having a program. And for the organizations themselves, the, whether it's a transit agency, whether it's the planning organization, whether it's a social service agency, um, the benefits are that uh, there's sort of that centralized uh, point of information that I mentioned before. Um, and it is important to know that people who do mobility management may not have that as their only role. They, um, in many respects, could be doing multiple jobs, whether it's within a transportation organization or a human service organization. It is really addressing the need to help people, um, you know, me, uh, identify what services are available and um, make the connections that are needed if possible. So um, this program, the Mobility Management Implementation Study that we are working on has a few key goals. Um, the first one is sort of the phase that we're in right now is to um, educate people, inform people what the program is about and, um, and work toward identifying the levels of participation that different organizations will uh, commit to over time. To do that, we are uh, sort of gathering as much as we can about um, existing services and needs, um, and also doing some research from other organizations that are doing this, other mobility management programs in different parts of the country, to develop a sort of a framework of what the service might look like. Um, and it will eventually lead to some agreements that are taking place um, between different organizations to participate in it, um, ideally with uh, uh, resources and funding available, and then uh, uh, ultimately a strategy for rolling the program out, which includes outreach and marketing. And I will mention that on that piece, we're definitely looking for input from you and, and others that um, uh, represent different communities. What is sort of the best way to reach people and to make sure that they are included in the process of uh, sort of making sure the program is workable? And I will talk about sort of ways that we want to do that, but ideas from you are, are more than welcome. We really want them. Um, so the project has a few phases. Right now, we are in kind of pulling together information, this early phase, um, the, uh, but also reaching out to different entities and groups to um, explain the program. Um, to, we'll be next sort of coming back to talk about what the framework might look like. And as I mentioned before, sort of this uh, uh, putting together an agreement um, in a, and a report. The second phase is the implementation phase. Once we have, uh, we know who's uh, participating, what it should look like for the region, what's going to make the most sense, um, what the strategy would work like, how it would interact with services that exist today, what is the best way to market it, and, and then finalize it in a report. Um, the participants in the study that are, are shown in a, in, a, in a chart here, and essentially it's a uh, funded by the city of Raleigh, Wake County, the town of Cary and Campo. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a mobility coordination committee. Campo is operating as the administrative agency, essentially our client as a consulting firm. And then there's a technical steering committee, 
which uh, includes Campo, Live Well Wake, Go Raleigh, North Carolina DOT, uh, Hartnett Area Rural Transit System Hearts, Johnson County Area Transit, um, uh, Kerr Area Transportation Authority Carts, the Town of Cary I mentioned, Go Triangle, Go Wake Access, Town of Apex, the Community Partnership Network, the Town of Wendell, Wake County Regional Centers, Housing Authority of Wake County, Wake County Veterans Administration, and Durham Chapel Hill Carborough MPO have been invited to participate in that. Um, we've done some research al sort of, uh, already into some other cities. These were identified as candidates, uh, cities of Austin, Texas, or regions, I should say, Austin, Texas, Nashville, Tennessee, Columbus, Ohio, Denver, Colorado. We're talking to Charlotte about the program they're trying to establish in San Francisco. And um, basically, I think the key points to be made here is that each of these regions takes a different, slightly different approach to implementing the mobility management program whether it be a, a region-wide approach in Austin where they have a mobility manager that's housed at the transit agency. In Nashville, Tennessee, the state DOT receives funding to have mobility management services provided with their own staff. In Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, the um, Columbus region is covered within one of six state um, um, regions that have been established that each covering nine counties. In Denver, there is an organization that was formed as a result uh, as an outgrowth of the regional planning organization there to um, focus on a series of services around transportation coordination uh, with, a, with a staff of five people. In uh, Charlotte's program is still in development. And then in San Francisco, they have a sort of a regional group that is um, a responsible for um, managing mobility throughout the region. So the timeline for the project, uh, it's, a, it's a, about a 20 month effort. Uh, we're in the beginning of the, or we're in, this, in the first phase of things right now doing the outreach. Um, what will happen over the next couple of months is that we're getting into, as I said, developing this framework. Um, and then the sort of the second year of the project will be focused on the implementation uh, approach. And then um, in terms of the engagement that we've done um, so far, We've put together some materials, um, a sort of a simple uh, flyer that just highlights what the pieces of a mobility, mobility management program are like. And then there's a more detailed document that is, um, uh, it provides a little bit more information about what, what programs look like. And of course, we're giving this presentation that I'm going through today. And um, we've uh, just for those of from Raleigh, for your interest, we've met with the Raleigh Transit Authority Board. We're meeting with you and then we have an upcoming meeting with the city council to present this as well. Um, going forward, as I mentioned, we will both pull together the information on sort of what we've learned about the region, uh, what some of the other regions are doing in the other regions in the country that are doing that are applicable um, and develop some strategies or some ideas about what the, what the program might look like in this region um, and come back uh, sort of to present the sort of the the preliminary framework and a more detailed round of engagement um, and then um, work to de develop um, um, these agreements that I mentioned as well that would you know, sort of commit organizations to participating in this going forward um, and then um, develop a uh, and next year there would be another round of engagement to do sort of pre presenting the final plan. So it's really good to have an opportunity to share with you what we're doing. And we have a couple of questions um, that we're posing to people. Essentially, the first one is like, you know, uh, is there anything that we haven't covered today that will help you better understand what mobility management is? And then anything that you see, because this is a great opportunity to hear from you, um, that would be things that we, you wanna make sure that we are paying attention to. Gaps in the program, like gaps in service, gaps in the uh, programs that would be uh, addressed uh, by mobility management program um, that, um, that you want to make sure we include in this. And, and I will, well, as we go through these questions, you know, I will uh, certainly answer them and try and talk about things that are, if there are things that aren't necessarily part of mobility management, but um, you may still want to bring to our attention. So that's the formal part of my presentation. I hope that people, um, who have specific questions um, um, can ask them now, and I'm happy to, to answer them. 
Uh, good afternoon. I'm Robert Parrish. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'm wondering if your program would consider pedestrian travel as I was a part of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee. Uh, that seems to be a gap uh, in the program. Uh, and the second question I have is, is your study going to uh, address um, areas where the low income persons live, whereby there may not be uh, access to transportation as easily. So thank you so much. So uh, the, the both really good points to mention. As far as the, um, we had a meeting with, uh, with Town of Cary yesterday and somebody asked a question about sidewalks and crossings and so forth, uh, particularly about uh, around places where there are higher concentrations of people who, who need access. And my answer to that was that, so thank you for bringing that to our attention because we hadn't really explicitly flagged that. Um, but absolutely, the way it would apply in my view would be that um, if the, the mobility manager or management, people doing mobility management would would uh, when I talked about sort of identifying barriers or gaps, that's sort of looking at the physical barriers that may exist and then bringing that to people's attention. So you know it may not be that the, the mobility managers would not necessarily address the specific thing, but their role would be to kind of pull the information together and say, hey, we have people living here they can't get to the bus, or we have people living here that can't cross the street, whatever the case may be, and that is a that is really important. As because when you think about being able to get around, you have to be able to travel to and from public transit or whatever services, other services in your neighborhood may exist. Exactly. Um, yeah. And as far as uh, people, this is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, let me just answer the second part of the question, if I may. The, the the as far as people of low income, I would say absolutely that is um, a, a high priority because um, we know from conversations that we've had from folks from the uh, staff that work at the service centers that they have a lot of people who uh, don't own vehicles, um, who are who don't live near public transportation, who have a really difficult time um, either getting to and from the service centers or accessing um, work, you know, getting to work, uh, lots of things. So absolutely, that is a priority. And that is something that, you know, with the people who work with um, uh, individuals who need services, being able to make those connections and so that they can say to you, if you were applying for help, okay, well, I see that you have a transportation need, I can connect you with this, or this is a program that we have to help people make, make a transportation connection. So it's a, it is a high priority. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Ricky Scott here. Uh, my question is uh, related to the issue of um, uh, the approach to the whole issue of, of transportation access. Uh, for persons with disabilities, uh, more in most cases, uh, access is kind of an afterthought. It's a reactive thing. Oh yeah, well, we don't have a, a crosswalk here that has an audible signal for somebody who is blind or whatever. Uh, my question is, the focus, you all need to make sure that, that a universal design or universal usability concept or full inclusion concept is integrated into this entire process from this inception so that uh, access uh, is fully inclusive of the entire communities that are that are out there. Okay, thank you. I totally agree with that. Uh, uh, just to follow up with Dr. Scott's point, uh, this is Robert again, Robert Pash. Uh, we would love for you to address this issue of the audible signals uh, in your work, the, your study, uh, because they're inconsistent. Uh, they're not, uh, they're uh, sometimes they're not user friendly um, and universal design. Yeah, uh, that would include the audible signals being everywhere uh, that's needed. Right. So what I would say, I think I mentioned at the top here that there are things that are not necessarily part of the study, but 
I think that what one of the things that we could how we could address that particular concern is that that when you think about what the role of a mobility manager might be in this region, um, it would be to, as I think I had a, a slide up earlier that talked about this sort of uh, convening and understanding and advocating um, that the, that that and that the awareness of of the need for such thing uh, for universal design and the uh, ability to sort of take this information and participate in groups and make sure that like just like you're bringing it up here that they're they're also bringing it up in in meetings and so forth but it's ultimately the implementation or the you know how that gets addressed is is typically done either by you know by the jurisdiction that owns the equipment as hard as that is to answer it that way that is that is typically how it gets addressed but the convening of of people who are uh who want, you know, and making sure that that's part of it. Then in other words, they would be making the same case that you're making essentially in, in their, as part of their role when they're um, working with other organizations and, and government and um, agencies to say like, don't forget about this. This is something that we, we've heard about a lot and needs to be addressed. Any other questions from anybody? I'd love to have you come to the Wet Federation of the Blind Bidding. I'll talk to Sean about how to get a hold of you. Maybe we'll invite you both. Yes. Well, one thing that I want to just mention before I finish is that we, um, we, we're talking with Campo right now about um, what would, how we can effectively, I guess, uh, vet the ideas that we come up with. And because we want to make sure that the program framework that we identify is um, workable, meets the needs of people that are going to actually benefit from something that gets implemented. Um, so we want to have um, an, a, 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 some outreach that is about presenting something rather than asking questions about what the needs are, but sort of like, here's what we're thinking of doing. What do you think is really what I'm getting at. So we would love to hear from you um, about making sure we have a complete list of the people that might participate in a focus group or a future meeting that would just say, give you an opportunity to see what we've come up with and make sure we haven't missed anything. That's kind of what I'm, I'm suggesting. So we welcome uh, names of organizations or um, people that we should reach out to. And um, I, I think, because Sean, you're the one who convened this. Maybe people should contact you. I don't know what the best way to, or, or you can put something in the yes. chat, but we definitely would like to make sure we have a complete list so that when the time comes that we've got something to show you, you can tell us whether we're, what, what we've missed, if we've missed anything or who we've missed. So I was gonna let All everyone right. know that if you guys had any, after this meeting is over and you start thinking of other things, other questions or other things you might wanna comment on, um, feel free to get that information to me and I'll be, make sure to get it over to the folks at um, Nelson Nygaard. They're compiling all that information as they're going along. Um, so um, you do have the opportunity after this meeting, like I said, to um, ask any other questions or add any other comments simply by getting that information to me. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate your uh, coming and presenting to us today. And we look forward to uh, continued cooperation on this issue. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abrams, for bringing it, for handling this. Thank okay. you, Bill. Uh, now we can uh, no, move on to our next. I'm no, sorry. Go ahead. One yes, second. Sir. Mr. Yes. Best had a question. Donnie, you got a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. One second. He's, he's unmuting himself. Give me one second. There you go, Donna. Can you? Okay. Yeah, there you go, Donna. I got you. Okay. okay. Now I was going to ask Mr. Avery, what was the command for uh, hand signal? Want to be acknowledged? I didn't write it down last time you told us. Star nine. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm using a computer. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, you know what? I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> we talked about it last time. I just looked it up real quick. Oh, oh okay. Wait for can access that uh, for me. We appreciate it.
Microphone this computer old plus R button. Raise hand button. Any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you all. Uh, our next presenter is going to be uh, Ms. Sarah Corin, who's with the uh, uh, Arts Grants uh, uh, Director with the City of Raleigh. And uh, she is going to be talking with us along with uh, Betty uh, Siegel from the JFK um, Center for the Performing Arts about an, an August uh, conference coming up. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing about this and participating to uh, what extent we can. Ms. Corin. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Hey, everybody. My name is Sarah Corin. I'm the Arts Grant Director for the city's Raleigh Arts Office. Um, and Betty and I are really excited to talk to you today about the Exchange in Arts and Disability Conference, which is produced by the John F. Kennedy Center out of Washington, D.C., and is headed to the Raleigh Convention Center for the first time, August 1st through 5th. Um, I'm sorry, I should also have start off by um, describing myself. So I'm a middle-aged mixed race woman with brown hair. Um, I'm wearing a black flowered top, uh, tortoiseshell glasses and gold earrings. Um, I have to say Raleigh Arts is particularly excited to have this conference come down because we've been using Betty's conference as our textbook, we run a annual peer cohort program around accessibility in the arts. Um, and we've been sending arts community members to this conference for the past, I think, six years. And, and Betty, as I was getting ready for this presentation, I, I realized that this is actually kind of a homecoming of sorts for the Kennedy Center because you always talk about all the great work that Ron Mace did up in Washington, D.C. And since he's actually, or was a North Carolina native and founder of the Center for Universal Design, it's, it's really kind of extra wonderful that you're coming down to spend time with us this summer. Um, and so it's my pleasure to hand it off to you, Betty, as Director of the Office of Accessibility and BSA for the Kennedy Center. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you, Dr. Scott, for allowing me to talk to your group. It's really wonderful. I have to second what Sarah said. Ron Mace and his work has influenced the renovation of every single one of our 10 theaters at the Kennedy Center, starting with his participation as the accessibility consultant on our 2,600 seat concert hall. And so every day when I go to the Kennedy Center, I am reminded of the really close relationship that we have with um, North Carolina. Um, aside from the fact that I adore Sarah Corin and think that she is an, a gem in your community. And I'm really always pleased to have the opportunity to participate with her. So I'm here to talk about the LEAD conference. I will describe myself. I am a middle-aged white woman with black hair and a shock of white that streaks through it in a little bit of a curl. I'm wearing bright red glasses because I think they make my eyes pop and they look really good on Zoom. Um, LEAD started 20 years ago, and it was started with Sarah Corin in the room because I realized that even though the ADA had been passed more than 10 years prior to that initial convening of LEAD, um, we really didn't know what was going on in the field of arts and culture in terms of access and inclusion of people with disabilities. And the reason why we didn't know is that there was no place where we could meet together to share peer to peer about the work being done in the arts and cultural community. So that's how LEAD really started. It was this wonderful opportunity to share with each other and to learn from each other. I frequently say steal from each other, but these days I say borrow with attribution because I did get a law degree and I'm not allowed to steal anymore but I do borrow other people's ideas all the time. And I've borrowed many of them from North Carolina and from Raleigh specifically. So we're excited to come to Raleigh. The LEAD conference in 2019, just prior to COVID, 
was convened in Denver. We had over 600 participants from more than 450 cultural institutions from not only around the United States, but from around the world. And so this is a fabulous opportunity to show off Raleigh and to show off the work of artists with disabilities in your community and the work of your cultural community and contributing to uh, the, the overall knowledge and understanding of access and inclusion in, in the United States. I'm excited that along with the conference and hopefully 600 people will all convene there. We have our fingers crossed that COVID will allow us to meet in person, um, that we will be bringing along with us an exhibit by 15 young emerging artists with disabilities. And we are collaborating with VAE to exhibit their work. It's an exhibit called Merge. And these young artists, uh, come from all around the United States. They reflect their work, reflects on their experiences as people with disabilities. And this year we have an incredibly diverse community of artists, of young artists, who not only uh, wrestle with the intersectionality of disability with their other identities as, as humans, but they also are wrestling with some of very deep economic and social issues that were brought up uh, not just because of COVID, but they were amplified because of COVID. And so for the first time, we are dealing with artists who are, are wrestling with um, economic disparities, with homelessness, with um, um, and with other social challenges. And we're delighted that they have allowed us to be a part of their lives and to tell their stories through their art. And we're also delighted to be bringing it to Raleigh, North Carolina in August. Um, we have presentations that lead that talk about compliance. We have presentations that lead that talk about um, sensory friendly performances and uh, uh, Alzheimer's gallery experiences in museums. It's a really wide ranging uh, conversation. And I'd love to have you all participate in that when we're in Raleigh. Um, I think. That's really what I have to say about the conference. We're so excited. Oh, I do have to say, there has been an informal competition amongst New York, between New York City, Pittsburgh, and Raleigh for years now as to who will bring the most members of their community to the lead conference. Now, I do think that Raleigh has the home advantage this year. So I expect them to beat New York City and Pittsburgh in the number of Raleigh attendees. Um, so I'm open to any questions you might have, or I know Sarah will help me field questions too. But I, I appreciate your letting me speak to you, and I do hope that we'll see you in Raleigh. Yes, uh, this is uh, Dr. Ricky Scott. I have a question. Uh, in terms of the uh, cost of participation uh, uh, for this event. That's an excellent question. There, we do charge a registration fee. I wish I could say it was all free, but we do keep our registration fee quite reasonable. The conference actually extends over approximately five days with three days of intensive convening. The price ranges between um, about $700 to down to 300, depending on whether or not we're able to offer scholarships. Woo. Okay. Now, I will all tell right. you, We've done a comparison with other similarly situated associations, mm -hmm. other arts and cultural convenings, and we are extremely cheap compared to uh, the cost of attending, for example, the APAP, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. Yes. Um, it seems like a lot, but it's, it's really not. The Kennedy Center's underwriting yes. rates about two thirds of the conference. Okay. Uh, well, we could receive the detailed cost of that. We'd appreciate that that Absolutely. will help us in making a decision about all of this. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Parrish, you have a question? Good, good afternoon, I am Robert Parrish. Uh, well, I have a brief comment. Maybe some help can be given to, uh, uh, to the disability community from the city of Raleigh as well. You might wanna consider that avenue uh, or the grants that might help us with that. That's, that is, that, even with it lower, that is a lot of money, but uh, I've realized that. But anyway, uh, I'm the incoming chair, uh, board chair of Arts Access Inc. in Raleigh, and I don't know if you've considered collaborating with uh, 
our new director, Miss Elaine Bagnall. Um, I'll give you her phone number. Her number is 919-833-9919. That's 919-833-9919. I'm sure that they will want to have collaboration with you. Mr. Parrish, I'm so glad you brought up Arts Access and thank yep. you for serving on their board. Betsy Ludwig has been a strong supporter of LEAD and attended every year. And Eileen Bagnell coming from Arizona has too. And I'm so delighted to see that Eileen is landing there in Raleigh with y'all. She's amazing. And Arts Access has always provided all of the audio description services at the LEAD conference now for many years. So we depend on you all. I have every intention of taking advantage of, of arts access. Um, just FYI, we do pay you guys, so it's not a freebie. <laughs> the board member, you yes, you that. do, right? <laughs> Hi, um, this is Shannon uh, Gardner. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I just want to say that as far as, you know, what the League Conference does and being able to, you know, present people with disabilities in the art community. That's awesome. And I'm hoping that I actually get to go this year. Um, <laughs> we'll see, but um, I really hope so because I, I like the work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Um, in addition to that, to answer the previous question for Mr. Best, in order to raise your hand using a computer, it's Alt-Y and that will help, that will raise it and lower it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any other questions uh, from anyone? Can I let Sarah jump in a minute? Because I know that Raleigh yes. um, has been so supportive of, of LEAD. And I know that one of the amazing things that Sarah has managed to work out are scholarships for the cultural community to participate in LEAD so that we are aware that the costs can be prohibitive. And if anybody else would like or knows any donors who would like to contribute to our scholarship funds, let me know. <laughs> hey, everybody. Okay. Sarah. Right. Um, the Raleigh Arts Office will be providing about, I think it comes to about 40 scholarships for members of the arts community. Um, one of our goals is to really uh, blow up accessibility, so to speak, across the arts community and use this as a really a, a citywide professional development or capacity building opportunity. Um, we've been sending about 12 people a year to the conference and have seen what a difference it's made in terms of the accommodations and services that some of the arts organizations in town provide. Um, and so we're trying to, to really ramp it up um, and get people moving forward in a good way um, by luring Betty and her conference down to Raleigh. So we will be providing okay. scholarships um, and uh, the United Arts Council of Raleigh and Wake County is working on scholarships as well. And we're in conversation with the North Carolina Arts Council um, and they're trying to work on a plan to provide scholarships, particularly for some rural communities, tier one communities across the state. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of how the arts funding community is looking at this conference, we, we really see it as a once in a lifetime opportunity to do a lot of accessibility work in a very short amount of time. Okay. Well, we certainly will look into uh, what potential uh, uh, sponsorship that uh, the uh, mayor's committee may be able to provide for uh, its uh, members or persons with disabilities. So we'll, we'll look into that and uh, uh, have an answer to our members about that. Um, Any other questions? Uh, this yes, is the ahead. other question, but I do want to throw in that we are really eager to identify and support young emerging uh, arts administrators okay. with disabilities okay. to participate at LEAD. Yeah. Um, you have a number of colleges and universities in, in the state and in Raleigh. And if we have that opportunity to um, teach young arts administrators now about accessibility so that when they go out and become the arts administrators of America across the United States, 
they bring their understanding of disability work and inclusion from you all with them. And that's really important to us. So if you know any young arts yes. administrators, let us know. All right. Any other questions? I had one question. Not, I, go right ahead. That's Donnie Best. Uh, when you say art uh, activities, um, I'm envisioning things like things that are tactual, visual, uh, even poetry. Am I in the right mindset? Yeah, we, you know, I talk about arts. The truth of the matter is this is a group of arts and cultural institutions. So it's, it's all things accessibility, all things. And okay. across um, not just the arts community, it is also the participants at LEAD tend to come from sports venues, stadiums, large entertainment arenas. We've had Disney participate before. Um, they haven't come recently. I don't know what's wrong with them. Um, we also include museums, science, children's, art museums. Um, we also work really closely to parks and recreational services because they also convene mm -hmm. and are places of public accommodation. So we have the National Park Service. Uh, we have aquariums and zoos. This is a great opportunity for us to really um, demonstrate the fact that there is a real audience for participating in culture broadly. So think big and broad, all arts, all culture, all the time. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from anybody? Well, thank you very much for coming to each of you for giving us such a, an informative presentation regarding this event coming up here in August. And we are certainly uh, looking forward to that and hoping that we can participate to the fullest extent possible. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you all for allowing us to talk to you uh, today. Thank you right. very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, well, um, Okay, on the agenda, well, Philip, uh, I guess I'm gonna have to turn it over to you to complete the meeting because I have another Zoom meeting that I'm in preparation for here coming up very soon. Thank you all very much for coming. And uh, Philip, it's all yours, my friend. Thank you very much, Ricky. Um, I wanna thank our excellent presenters today. Um, Nelson Nygaard Associates and Sarah Corrin and um, Betty Siegel. Um, we have a few more items for today. We will do public comments and then old business and new business. So I would like to ask if anybody has any public comments and if you would like to make some, please introduce yourself and allow, keep your Limit your public comment to about two minutes, please. Do we have any public comment today? Uh, Donnie Best, you raise yeah, your right. hand. Yeah, right. Thank go, you. Donnie. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, this is one tour for Mr. Abram. I wanted a clarification for the uh, existing program of transportation. Is it under essential skills or is something else included? Is he still with us? It seems Mr. Donnie, he has hopped off. Um, I can work to get that question to him um, okay. and try to get your response back. Okay. Yes, thank you, Donnie. We can email that question to him and see what we find we can share, he can share. Okay. Is there anybody else who has any public comments? Um, <laughs> it's me again. Johnny, do you still okay. have your hand up? Yes, yes. I uh, have another question I wanted to. I don't know how much in advance uh, the, the uh, forum is up and up to, to Zoom prior to. But I'm asking that some consideration be put into maybe 10 minutes before the meeting uh, or whatever, because 
lot of times it is trial and error. You start and you miss it, and you have to back out and try it again. Uh, and if it's something like five minutes, it doesn't seem it's not going to be adequate enough for people to try to get into the meeting um, successfully. Sometimes you will. A lot of times you will have to back out and try again. And if it's not working that way, you may have to use the phone. A certain amount of time should be allotted uh, prior to the actual meeting. Donnie, this is Thorpe Woodward. Thank you very much for that comment. And Ricky and I would be happy to talk to Demetrius Edwards about um, how early or how soon we open up these mayor's committee meetings so that everybody can get in and get through any of the technological hurdles and be able to participate fully. So thank you for sharing that feedback. I appreciate it. Do we have any other questions or public comments today? From anyone? Going once, going twice. Okay, we will move on to new business. Do we have any new business that anybody wants to bring up today? Wait, I think I'm supposed to do old business first. Do we have any old business today? I do not hear any old business. Do we have any new business? I'm sorry, Phil. I was I was muted. Uh, I uh, I uh, was just wanting to say that as far as the it, a conference um, that I referred to for uh, through the sub housing committee. Um, I talked with um, um, the bearded one, Demetrius, and uh, he and I are working on a date uh, for the uh, for this event, uh, which we're going to discuss uh, uh, problems with disabled persons uh, slash uh, persons of racial minority when it comes to gentrification, and we're thinking of having this uh, this uh, Zoom seminar slash panel discussion a week before the uh, conference on housing, which takes place in late April. Robert, this is Philip Woodward. Thank you very much for sharing that information. And Lori will send out the date when that information becomes available. Yes, sir. Does anybody else have any old business or new business today? This is Philip Woodward. I'm going to share that um, I saw an email on the last day or two that Lori Millette sent out the scholarship application. Um, and it is due May 31st. So if you know any students with a disability who live in Raleigh, who might be interested in a scholarship to help with their educational expenses, please feel free to share that. Lori sends it to all of her contacts in the school system. But I just wanted to let you know that's available now. Is there any other old or new business? If there is not, then I want to remind you all that our next mayor's committee meeting will be on the third Thursday in March. I'm verifying the date real quick. Let's see, March 17th. It'll be, it'll be today, So that Phil. will be St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so be sure to wear your green when you come to the meeting that day so that the virtual leprechaun does not pinch you. And we are done. So I would like to make a motion to close out the meeting if nobody else has any questions or comments or items you want to share. And I will I will remind you, um, I appreciate Ricky Scott having the moment of silence for Ronnie Marshall, our deceased member at the beginning of the meeting. And there will be a memorial service for him on Saturday, February 26th at Hasbro. Church, 
on Creedmoor Road in North Raleigh, and Lori sent out the information along with Ronnie's obituary for that. So if you look at Lori's emails, you will have all of that information. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.